shall be more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Let sorrow do its work, send grief or pain, sweet are thy messengers, sweet they refrain, when they can sing with me, more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry. My heart shall raise This still its prayer shall be More love, O Christ, to thee More love to thee More love to thee God is faithful, is he not? All the time. Amen. Let's sing. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And I want you all to join in and sing and make a joyful noise. It's Sabbath evening, right? It's worship time. So let's worship him. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold weakness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, New mercies I see, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me, pardon for sin and the Peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright 
bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I had needed, thy hand had provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto faithful to us have we been faithful to him draw me nearer 306 I am thine O Lord I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. So draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. May my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. So draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. At this time, we'll have the elder sister Rosa come on up here and give us the information for the night. Sabbath. Have you been having a blessed week? Uh, I thank God that he has brought us to the end of another week and, and that we have the privilege you know, to welcome, well we already welcome the Sabbath, but to spend these Sabbath hours together with each of you. Um, tonight once again we will be blessed with a special message from your manservant, um, Elder Jeremiah Davis. God has sent him to us for such a time as this. It is, it is our responsibility to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in what we ought to do when he leaves tomorrow. So I do pray that as the message is sent, because I always tell my kids, knowledge is power. And that means when we have this knowledge that God has given us, we cannot keep it for ourselves. We have to share it with others. And, and through the love that Christ has um, shown us, 
we have to show that love to each and every one that we come in contact with. We now have our offering. And would the, those responsible for offering come forward, please? Just have a little change with that. Um, the offering plates are where pastor is right now, so we'll do the offering at the end of the service. But now we will be blessed with special music by Sister Audrey Clement. the sweeter he grows are you still in love with Jesus tonight is he sweeter as the days go by if not you need to check yourself you need to check yourself let us all stand as we sing our theme song 311 more about Jesus I would be like Jesus we do all four all four Earth 
earthly pleasures vainly call me, I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. He has broken every fetter, I would be like Jesus. That my soul may serve him better, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus is my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. my song in the home and in the throng be like Jesus all day long I would be like Jesus that in heaven he may meet me I would be like Jesus that is why my song in the home and in the throng be like Jesus all day long I would be like Jesus Amen, you may be seated Are there anyone here for the first time tonight? One, two, welcome. You will be blessed. We have been blessed. We've had several messages from Pastor Jeremiah Davis. We've been praying for a, a revival. I believe the revival has begun. We've been praying for a reformation. I can say the reformation has begun. I don't know about you, but I know it began in my heart. Say, so if there's only one person, I know for a fact that person is me, but I know it's not just me. It is just the beginning, my friends. When he's gone, we must carry on, and we must follow through, or else it would all have been in vain. And Jesus didn't die for us to be in vain, nothing to be in vain. Now that we have found the offering plates and we have deacons in places, I'll invite them to stand. We collect the offering, but let us pray before we do that. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. In thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done in this church tonight. Let your will be done in our lives, individually and collectively. Father, as we come before you, may we offer ourselves to you first and foremost. May we, offer your, may we offer you our hearts, because if you have our hearts, the pocket will come, Father. So as we give, may we give gladly, thinking that you gave, you gave us all, Father. And what we give you is nothing in return. But we do so with gratitude and with thanksgiving. Receive now the offerings, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. After the collection of the offering, the next voice you'll hear is none other than Pastor Jeremiah Davis. 
I know you've been blessed. Our hearts have been pricked. Our hearts have been stirred, hopefully, to righteousness. God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Remember, come to Sabbath school if you want a seat reserved. You better be here 9.30 tomorrow morning. God bless you. Father, as we come together, we plead for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. You know, tonight is not like any other night, amen? Tonight is a very special night. And we believe that when the sun set this evening, that we move from common time into sacred time. Amen. You see, on every day of creation, when we deal with the days of creation, God did something good on every day, but he didn't bless every day. He did something good every day, but he did not sanctify every day. But today, God sanctify this day. And we know that God's day does not start as man starts his day at midnight. From Friday Eve at set of sun, Christian households then should meet, pray, and sing at Jesus' feet. You know, the only way to sanctify something is for God to put his presence in it. When Moses stood on the ground and God said to Moses, the, take your shoes from off your feet. He said, the place in which you stand is holy ground. It wasn't because that desert was holy. You know what happened to that desert? The presence of Jesus. And the presence of Christ can take anything common and make it sacred. My friends, what God did today, he put his own presence in this day. And a sanctified day is to hold to us a sanctified people. I want Jesus' presence to be in me, amen? amen. I can tell you, you can't have heaven without the presence of Christ, can you? In fact, take your Bibles. I want you to see something before we stop and pray. In the book of 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, we found that a Christian home is to be all that the word implies. Is that right? Avenus Home, page 15. First page of that wonderful book says that the home should be all that the word implies. It should be a little what? A little heaven upon the earth. Now, my friends, in order to understand what heaven on earth is, we need to know what heaven up there is. Is that right? Notice what the Bible says in 1 Kings 8, beginning now. We're looking for the definition of heaven. In verses 43. The Bible says, you're there, amen? It says, beginning 
in verses 43, it says, Hear thou where? In heaven. I wonder what it is. It says, In heaven thy dwelling place. What is heaven? It's the dwelling place of God. And do according to all that the stranger called thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee and do thy people Israel. And that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. So this house that was called by thy name, the Bible says that thy dwelling place is where? Heaven. Verse 49, it says, Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication where? In heaven. What is heaven? Thy dwelling place. So if our home are going to be a little heaven upon the earth. Our homes must become what? A dwelling place. Now, Jesus will visit any home. You know that, don't you? I said Jesus will visit any home, but he won't dwell in every home. The devil will even visit hell. Psalm says, if you make your bed in hell, Christ is there. He will visit and take prisoners out of hell, but he won't dwell there. He will go into Babylon and take his people out of the false churches. But he won't dwell there. That's the habitation of devils. And my friend, it's amazing that sometimes we think that just because God visits our heart, that he visits our home, we think that we have heaven. My friends, don't let it mean that just because God saves you and visits you, don't think that you're in heaven. You see, God can visit places that he will not dwell but if God is going to dwell in your heart, if God is going to dwell in your home, that means that everything in your home must be just like it is in heaven. It must be pure. It must be clean. Every room must be clean. This was so serious that when Jesus was resurrected from his tomb, he was not in such a rush to get back to heaven, but that he folded his clothes. I wonder if he would have come to our house if it would look like heaven. But my friends, more than our houses, what about our hearts? Amen? Amen. Oh, that God may make our home just like heaven. What do you say? Amen. This is the answer to the world's problems. Before we stop and pray, I want to show you something else in the book of Daniel. What did I say? In the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter. We've been talking about some very serious things this week. And I believe that we haven't come to an end of it yet. The Bible says in Daniel 7, look at what it says in Daniel 7, beginning in verses 25, speaking of that little horn, that antichrist power, that beast. The Bible says in Daniel 7, beginning in verses 25, you're there, Amen. It says, and he shall speak great words against who? The Most High. That's bad enough right there. But the Bible says, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. You know what it means to wear out? And there used to be a time when mothers and fathers said, if you keep acting up, I'm going to wear you out. I don't know if they're doing that today based on the generation that I see. But to wear something out means that they've been attacked, amen? <laughs> they've been persecuted. The Bible says that the devil says he's going to speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to do what? He's going to think to change times and law. So the Bible says this Antichrist power is going to literally believe that he can change the times and the law of God. And if you notice that, that's really talking about a time law. And there's only one law in the Bible that has to do with time. You go through those Ten Commandments. And not one of them has to do with the time except for the fourth commandment that says on the seventh day that God rested. And my brothers and sisters, the Bible said that this power would come 
And he would think to change not only the law, but the time in the law. But my friends, he couldn't do it, could he? The Bible didn't say he could do it. The Bible says he shall think. But I'm so thankful for Jesus. Jesus, when he came in his very first sermon on the mount, said, Think not that I am come to change times and laws. He said, I didn't come to change it. I came to fulfill it, not to destroy it, until heaven and earth pass away. My words, not a jot nor tittle, shall be taken from my law, my word. And so the very power that would think to change times and law cannot be the power of Christ. It must be antichrist. My friends, right now today, while the world is sleeping, that power is seeking to change that law and in America to pass a national Sunday law. And we're not ready, my friends. And so we want to stop before we get into our message this evening. We're going to study tonight something that we have entitled the image of the beast. The image of the beast. But before we study that tonight, we're going to do as it is our custom. And our custom is that we spend how long in prayer? Three minutes. Three minutes. And so if you can reverently kneel with me and those that are coming in, if we can quickly find our seats so that we can talk to God. We're going to spend three minutes in silent petition to the God of heaven. And I'm going to ask that while we have opportunity, I know we can forget sometimes. Let's cut off our cell phones, amen? amen. We don't want it to disturb the movement of the Spirit. Let's just spend three minutes asking for the presence of God, that He'll do something special tonight. And after three moments of private prayer, I will close out, out loud from up front, and we'll get into the message, the image of the beast. Oh, Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we serve a merciful God. 
We're so thankful, Lord, that from the beginning of this world, you have ordained this day that you had it in your heart that every one of us, that if we would come to Jesus, could find help and healing. Lord, even now, and I feel your presence, Father. So often we are unaccustomed to your presence. And we can be satisfied with just hearing words from men. We can be satisfied with just coming to church as a routine, but very rarely, Lord, do we recognize your presence. Oh, Father, you're here with us tonight. I dare not address your people, Lord, unless you cleanse me, unless you fill me, unless you give me the words to say, Lord, what can I say? I plead with thee, Lord, that you might move me out of the way and that you may speak to me and through me to thy people. Father, we're on the verge of the greatest crisis of the ages, and yet not only is the world asleep, but the churches are drunk with the wine of Babylon. And Lord, your remnant church that should be wide awake and given the trumpet a certain sound is asleep at her post of duty. And we plead with thee tonight, Lord, for a deeper revival and reformation. Father, in these next two days, as we come to a close in this week of prayer, nothing can be done unless we have your spirit. Steal the mouths of babies. Calm them, Lord, in your presence. Be with young people and children. Be with adults, Lord. May all talking mouths be hushed. May cell phones be cut off and not used as an agency of the adversary just when we need to hear you most. Forgive us, Lord, for our carelessness. Coming into your presence with chewing gum. Coming to your presence, Lord, not really recognizing what it is to, to come into the presence of a holy God. Lord, in times past, men were struck down dead for having sin in their lives and coming into thy presence. And the only reason, Lord, we're not consumed today is only your mercy we're not consumed. Because it fills not every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Father, please, give us your spirit from the most holy place, Lord. Cleanse us. Remove every distraction. Abide with us now as we get into the message, the image of the beast. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If we'll take our Bibles and turn to the last book of the Bible, to the last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation chapter 13, to the book of Revelation chapter 13, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You see, my friends, we are very clear when we study the Bible that the great controversy between Christ and Satan. That great controversy that has been going on now for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. That age-long controversy between the Michael, the archangel, Jesus himself, and his great arch enemy, the devil, we're told in this last generation is going to come to its culmination. And my friends, every calamity we see today Every crisis we see today, every trial and tribulation that we see today is a part of a series of events and which the Bible tells us is going to lead us into the final crisis over the seal of God on the one hand and the mark of the beast on the others. Our eternal destiny is going to be decided based on what happens at this crisis. And in fact, everything we know when we study the Bible, everything we know concerning the end of the world, everything we know concerning end time events, everything we know concerning the time of trial and tribulation and trouble 
and Sunday laws. Everything we know is a direct result of the development of the image of the beast. Of the what? My friends, it's so vital that we understand what this image is. Unless we understand the image of the beast, we're lost. Heavenly Father, please, don't let us be distracted, dear God. We pray that as we come in and take our seats very quickly, that you allow us to sense the reality of where we are in this earth's history. Focus us, Lord, on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, don't let us be distracted. Amen? Amen. It's all right when people find their seats. Let's keep looking at the Bible. Amen. You see, my friends, the devil, he, if he can divert us, he got us. That's why he made the television. That's why he made the radio. That's why he made all of these things that the world has. Men today will look more at their CDs, and they put them in, and they listen to what the rap song is world, and it diverts them from their Bibles. The devil will do anything to keep us from being focused on the word of God. His plan is to develop an image of the beast before we know it. And if he can hold us in darkness and deception until the image of the beast is developed, he knows he has us. Why? Because the image of the beast will test us. Listen to what this says. Listen to what the prophet says. It says, the Lord has shown me how? Clearly. That the image of the beast will be formed when? Before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. That means that what happens of our response to the image of the beast, if we're not ready by the image of the beast, we're lost, my friends. Our eternal destiny is going to be decided by this image of the beast. And this says, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are what? seal it says all who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah the seal of God is the banner of Jehovah it is the seventh day Sabbath of creation the banner of the devil is the mark of the beast it's the Sunday Sabbath and the world doesn't know this there are good Christians that don't know this there are many in the world that don't know this, and somebody has to tell them. The Bible says that God's message must go through every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Why? A crisis is coming. A storm more severe than anything this world has seen. And God says, let my people know before it is too late. My friends, we think that the wars are terrible. This war is nothing. We think that when North Korea hit South Korea and we saw the bomb exploded, we thought maybe that was some war. We haven't seen no war. The events that we see today is getting ready to lead to the battle of Armageddon. A battle such as nothing that we've seen on this earth. And it says that we are going to have to take our sides and those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Those who, even though the Bible tells them that the seventh day is a Sabbath, when they study it, that will turn and accept a Sabbath of man's origin will leave the God of creation. My friends, this is why as we look at the image of the beast, we must understand what it is. Is the image of the beast something that a church has made up? Or is it in the Bible? If it's in the Bible, where is it? Revelation 13. Let's look at it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter. Beginning now in verse 14, let's notice what the image of the beast is. Beginning now in verse 14. You're there, Amen. In verse 14, the Bible says, concerning the two-horned beast, and deceive of them that does what? That dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of what? In the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should do what? Make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. The Bible says that the two-horned beast is going to make an image of the beast. Question, what is the image of the beast? Who is the image of the beast? Now, you're getting quiet on me. Who is the image of the beast? No, Rome is not the image of the beast, my friend. That's the beast. Who is the image of the beast? No, America is not the image of the beast. My friends, listen, watch the point. America is not the image of the beast. America is going to form an image to the beast. 
America is the two-horned beast. In fact, look at Revelation 13, 11. Let's look at that. In Revelation 13, 11, it says, And I beheld what? Another beast coming up out of the earth. We found out in the Bible that a beast in Bible prophecy is not a literal beast. It's a prophetic beast. And a beast and Bible prophecy represents a kingdom or a nation. Where is that in the Bible? Daniel 7 verse 23. Is that right? It tells the beast represents a kingdom. If you don't have it, write it down in your notes. It tells us a beast is a kingdom or a nation. And so when the Bible says that a beast is rising up out of the earth, this is a nation. A kingdom that is going to get the attention of the entire world. Who is this torn beast? We studied and found all of the identifying marks. We found this beast would come up out of the earth. And we found that out of the earth that it would arise in 1798. Right after the Roman Catholic Church received the daily wound. And was thrown in prison after the French Revolution. What year that happened? 1798. At that same time. We saw that in verse 11, another beast would arise out of the earth. We found out the earth represented an area not heavily populated. We found out that that nation would arise in the new world, in the western continent. We found out that that nation would have horns like a lamb. We found out a lamb in Bible prophecy represents Jesus. John saw Jesus in John 1.29. In the Gospel of John 129, he saw Jesus and was getting ready to baptize him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the, 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 the sins of the world. That Lamb represented Jesus. And when the Bible says that this beast would have horns like a lamb, a horn is always the controlling power of a nation. In the ancient times, those horns you read in the Bible had crowns. It meant that the rulership of that country was a king that wore a crown. But my friends, you find that when there is no crown on the horns, it is a government that is run not by a king, not by a crown, but it is a government that's ruled by another power other than a king. And that power, that form of government was two. It was the civil power and the religious power that laid the foundation of Protestantism and Republicanism. And as Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address in 1863, Speaking of this government that we have called America, he said that this is a government of the people, for the people, by the people. That's the government of America. Do you know that before 1798, that form of government was almost unknown? Before 1798, the forms of government were kings, monarchs. Look at France and England. But now something happened in 1798, and the Bible told us, do you know the Bible even told us the form of government of this two-horned beast? It told us it would be a republic. Look at what it says. Revelation 13, 14. Let's look at it again. Closer look. Speaking of the two-horned beast, it says, And deceive of them that dwell on the earth by the means of those, what? Miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that, what? Now notice what happens. Saying to them that do, what? That dwell on the earth, that who? That they should make a what? Image to the beast. Now listen now. Here is someone, the leaders of America, talking to those that dwell in America. And they said to them that they, who are the they? That's the people. So that is a form of government where the power rests not in crowns, but in what? In they. Who is the they? That's the people. And a form of government. In which the power rests with they or the people, we call that a republic. Is that right? Now, come on, listen to me. Come on, come on. Listen, listen. Don't be distracted. Amen. Let them sit down. It's all right. But the form of government in which the power rests with the people is a republic. Is that right or wrong? The Bible says that this is unmistakable proof that this government is the United States of America. Now, my brothers and my sisters, if America is not the image of the beast, America is the two-horned beast, then what is the image of the beast? America is going to do something that in its form of government is going to change from a republic and its form of government is going to change until something that the Bible calls the beast. Now, my brothers and my sisters, before it does that, though, America must become a particular into a particular experience. In fact, we note it 
that this was a republic form of government. We found out that this two-horned beast is none other than the United States of America. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says that, that America is going to do. In Revelation 13, 11, it says, And I beheld, what? Another beast come up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. What was the only country? Rising in 1798, rising as a Christian nation, rising with a republic form of government. That's America. But the Bible says that before it's over, it's going to change. You ever heard the word change? It's getting ready to change. And while we are watching the change, we see things changing. And my friends, let me tell you something. While America is changing, you better let your heart change. Because if we're not changed, we'll be unready for the change that's getting ready to take place. Oh, we're getting, Nicky, we're going to get a change. The Bible says that this country that is starting off so great as a Protestant and Republic gov uh, government that had horns like a lamb, like a Christian nation. The Bible says in verse 11 that when it's finished, it's going to speak how? As a dragon. That's the devil. We found out that a dragon speaks with persecution. We found out that it persecutes those who keep the commandments of God. We found out that America is going to pass a Sunday law to persecute those who keep the commandments of God and every principle of the Constitution is going to be thrown away. Now, when is that going to happen? That's what we're studying. Our quest tonight is to find out how near are we to that happens. How near are we to the change of America where we will see church and state unite to pass a Sunday law? Because listen to me, Seventh day Adventists, when that Sunday law is passed, it's too late to try to get ready. Now, in the world, I don't know anything about this. Christian churches are trying to save America when they pass the Sunday law, but it's too late for those who should know what it means. My friends, it's time to get ready like we've never gotten ready before. And we're studying how near are we to this event. We found that everything in the Bible must happen according to a particular order. We found that the Bible teaches that Rome, the first beast, the Roman Catholic Church, and the second beast, the United States of America, that these two powers would not be against each other, that they would end up actually working together. Now, do you know that years ago, no one would have ever believed that? If you studied history, anybody who has a casual understanding of American history, you go home and check it out. You get on Google. You go to the uh, uh, library. You look up in your encyclopedia. Look up what happened in American history. You find out that the pilgrims, they didn't come over here because they just wanted another good government. The pilgrims left because they were trying to get away from the religious persecution of the Roman Catholic Church. This is history. Over 50 to 100 million Christians were persecuted and brutally aligned because they believed in the Bible. And this is why that, uh, that those pilgrims left to come to America to establish a country in which religious persecution could not be administered. And this is why it set the foundation for the Declaration of Independence. But it will not remain that way forever. We say that we landed on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock is going to land on us. That persecution is going to affect us and destroy us. And unless we know Jesus, we can't go through this. And my brothers and sisters, we're studying how near is this event before it takes place. Because listen now, though that was a long time ago, do you know that before the 1960s, that if the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope of Rome, had come to America before the 60s, he would have been stoned by every American. I told you. That in 1964, the biggest thing was that when John F. Kennedy became president, you remember him, don't you? When he became president in 1964, the biggest thing was he was the first Roman Catholic president in the United States of America. America was in uproar. And I told you it was strange that he died very quickly, didn't he? My brothers and my sisters, we must understand something is going on, but, 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 but we see one of the first major unions, something happened because if that happened in 1960s, how in the world in 1995 did Time Magazine call him the man of the year in America? We found out that in the mind of the child of prophecy, in order to understand prophetic events, we must understand their order. When we understand the alphabetical order, we don't have to guess at what letter is coming next. If we say B, what comes after B? C. We don't guess. That's alphabetical order. When we say 3, what comes after 3? 4. We don't guess. That's numerical order. And when we study the prophecies, we found from the Bible 
That we must understand the order of the prophecies so that we can understand where we are. We read this, Education 178, that says, The history which the great I am is marked out where? That's the Bible, in his word. Uniting link after link in the prophetic chain. From eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected when? In the time to come. It says all that prophecy has foretold is coming to pass until the present time has been traced where? On the pages of what? History. So if we're going to understand prophecy, what must we understand? History. It says it must be traced on the page. It can be, has been traced on the pages of history. And we may be assured that how much? All which is yet to come will be fulfilled. How? In its order. And if we understand the order, we don't guess. We have a chart, my friends. God said, I will do nothing but reveal my secret to the servants of the prophets. Amos 3, 7. Now listen. If we understand the order of events, we can find out when the Sunday laws pass, not by date, but by the order of events. Revelation 13 tells us what those order of events are. We found out that first, Rome and America will begin working together. That wasn't there before the 60s. In fact, this is a Time magazine that just, come out, just came out, and it says, Papal Diplomacy. Once what? What does it mean when it says once Chile? There was no relationship. You say that person was cold, it means they didn't have a relationship. So it says, once cold, Chile, U.S. Vatican relations have grown steadily warmer over what? Now they're ready to get in bed with each other. This was the Time magazine of 2008. This said that in 1899, this is time, I didn't make it up, this is history. In time, it said the U.S. church is so ill-respected that the Pope names it a heresy. After its progressive social ideas, the Pope called America a heresy. But in 1995, we called him the man of the year. Something happened to change this relationship. We found out there's something called Vatican II. What did I say? Oh, my friends, we need to know about Vatican II. We don't have time to talk about it tonight, though. First papal visit, 1965. First time the Pope ever came to America. But my friends, it's not like that today. You can get this. This came from the uh, encyclopedia. Look what this says. It says the United States ambassador to what? Now, my friends, this should tell us that something is different. Listen to me. There is no other church that has an ambassador but the Church of Rome. Only countries have ambassadors. Now you'll find out how important that is a little later. Now this says, look at this now. This came there, it says, the U.S. ambassador serves as that country's official representative to the Holy See since formal diplomatic relations began in what year? 1984. So there was no open relationship between Rome and America before 1984. No open relationship, but there became a first open relationship in 1984 and America sent her first ambassador to the Church of Rome and Rome sent an ambassador to America. Now my brothers and my sisters, listen to me. The Bible, even though no one in history would have ever thought, they would have never thought. I mean, think of it. Protestants were trying to get away from this. Luther, who started off in the Lutherans, Protestant Reformation, who rose up against the Pope and priests and said that the Bible is more powerful than any word of a man. And as a result, he was named a curse, and they threw away his writings, and every other Christian church that is not Catholic is called a Protestant. Baptists are called Protestants. Pentecostals are called Protestants. Methodists are called Protestants. Seventh day Adventists are called Protestants. Every other Christian church that is not Roman Catholic is called Protestant. Why? They are said to have protested against what the church taught that was not in the Bible. That's the history of the churches. But my brothers and my sisters, something has changed today. And the Bible says that, 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 that we see a difference now. And this says that there would be this union where America would come back to Rome. In Revelation 13 and 11, look at what it says concerning America. Beginning now in verses after, it talks about it speaking as a dragon. Verse 12 says, and he exercises how much? All the power of what? Of the first beast. Before him and cause of the earth and them which dwell therein. To worship the first beast. Who is the first beast? That's the Roman Catholic Church system. Many Christians in that church. They don't know this. 
I told you I've seen many priests and nuns when we study the Bible, they've heard it, come out of it because they believe the Bible. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, listen to me. Any man who claims to be God, that's an abomination. Any man who claims to begin sin, that's an abomination. Only Jesus, who died on the cross, can forgive our sins. And any system, I said any system that teaches it can do what Christ can do, is antichrist. Amen. My friends, we must exalt Jesus. And the Bible says very clearly in Revelation 13, the Bible says that this America is going to cause the world to worship Rome by exercising all the power. We found out last night that that showed us the time when America would pass the Sunday law. We found out that the first beast of Rome, how much power did it have over the world? What do we say? We found out that it, look at verse 7. Concerning the first beast, look at his power. Concerning the first beast in verse 7 it says, it says, and it was given unto him to make war on the saints. And to overcome them. And how much? Power was given him what? Over how much? All kindreds and tongues and what? How many nations? All nations. How much is all nations? What do we call that? All nations we call the world. Is that right? And so this beast had power over all nations or had power over all of the world. And my brothers and sisters, we read that and we found out about prefixes. We found out the prefix at the beginning of the word. It tells us about the word. And when we want a prefix for under, what is the prefix? Sub. You have a submarine that goes underwater. Marine water, sub, under. You have a subway. It's something that goes underground. So the prefix for under is sub. But the Bible doesn't say that the beast would have power under all nations. It says that the beast would have power how much? over all nations and I asked you that yesterday and I told you what is the prefix for over if the prefix for under is sub super you can look at that in Webster we talked about that even Webster tells you that and so we found out that this would be a, the beast the first beast was the world's how much was it one of the superpowers you can have power over all nations unless you are not a superpower unless you are the superpower. Now watch me now. Watch the Bible. This is the power it had, but it said it will receive a deadly wound. In 1798, the Pope lost his power. Study history. Go to look up French Revolution. In 1798, the Pope himself was taken over in that revolution and was thrown into prison. They said, away with God. Atheists took over the country. And they threw away with all popes and took priests and killed them and murdered them. My friends, all of a sudden, the Pope died in prison in 1798. The papacy received a daily wound. But the Bible said it wouldn't receive that wound forever. It said all oh, that daily wound will be healed, and all the world would wonder after the beast. How? Because of the second beast. First beast is not going to do that. Second beast is going to do it. Look at what it says. We read back now in verse 12 concerning the second beast, and it says, And he exercised of how much? All the power of the first beast. So when America passes a Sunday law and persecutes the world, it's going to exercise not some of the power, but all of the power of the... And what was the power of the first beast? Not just the superpower. The world superpower. So before America, this is the order. Everything must happen. How? In its order. We don't have to guess. After one comes two. After two comes three. After A comes B. After B comes C. If we understand the order of prophecy, we don't have to guess. And so we have to trace through history. The Bible says that before America can enforce a Sunday law, pass the mark of the beast, persecute like a dragon, the Bible says that it must exercise all of the power of the... Now, my friends, how can you exercise the world superpower unless you first become the world superpower? You can't do it. That suggests an order. Now, I want to ask you a question. If that is the order, first America must become the world superpower... When historically did America become the world superpower? The world can't come to an end before this takes place. When did the world, let's trace it on history, amen? Let's see what history tells us. We noticed that this said time, how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solitary movement and hasten the demise of what? Communism. This is called the Holy Alliance front cover. This is history. Time magazine. If you don't believe in the Bible, history tells us that Rome and America came together 
and they brought down communism. Why was it important that communism had to fall? Why was that important? What was communism before it fell? And this is the year 1989. Watch it now. We found out 1989, Newsweek front cover, changing the course of what? Remember, everything we believe should be traced on the pages of history. And this says, 1989, this is the year. 1989, watch it now, we're studying in the order. And this says, this is that Newsweek that blew it up, showed you what's in it. 1989, Newsweek, notice what it says. It says, the protesters didn't always overcome. There was poison gas to stop them in Soviet Georgia and bullets in Beijing. Still, 1989 was the year that the communist God finally what? Failed. When it was over, the people had changed the course of history. This was prophecy. The Bible told us this would happen. This already happened. Jesus said, I tell you, before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you might believe. Now watch what it says. It says, the ice that locked how much? The world into 40 years. Now I want to ask you, how long did that take? How far did that take you back? How far did that take you back? This is 1989, 40 years. Come on, math majors. All right. Takes you to what? 1949. Remember this now. That's 1949. How long was it locked up in this Cold War? 40 years. When did that end? And put 1989. Now watch. This says it was breaking up, but the breakup itself posed new questions. Could the march of freedom prevail even in the strongholds of Moscow and Beijing? Or would repression succeed? Could Gorbachev be toppled by a new hardliner or military, military adventurous? Was the pace of change spinning out of control? Now watch what it says. It says, what would the new world order be like? What? What would the new world, this is Newsweek. What would the new world order be like? And was America doing enough to prepare for it? Above all, could the world's leaders seize the chance to act to, to set common goals or would they lurk toward new quarrels and disasters? Dangers lie ahead, but 1989 was one, was, was one of those years, coming perhaps twice in a century, that changed the world how long? Yes, it does. This is prophecy. Now, my friends, this is from 1949 to 1989, but when this happened, what did it do? Look at what it says. This is an encyclopedia. This is history. This says the United States and Soviet Union were the two what? Now, we built that from the Bible. But this prophecy could not be filled. The beast could not be enforced the mark through the America until America became not a superpower, but what? The superpower. To exercise all the power of the first beast. No son in law before that. That's the order. It says, but now, here, it said this was the two superpowers during the Cold War. Here, Ronald Reagan and Michael Gorbachev meet in 1985. But now notice what happens after this. After the dissolution of what? The Soviet Union. The U.S. was left not as a superpower. It was left as the soul. What does soul mean? As the sole world superpower. This is prophecy. But now it's history. Is traced on the page of history, and my friends, as I told you last night, every Seventh Adventist that saw this happen in 1990 should have woke up. They should have saw that things were lining up according to Revelation 13, and we proved last night, my friends, that after this took place, there were only six events. How many did I say? Six. Only six events since 1990 that will lead to the passing of a son law and the time of trouble and persecution. And I showed you, or at least I told you, that last night that in 2008 we reached number five. That there's only one more before the St. Lawrence pass, and we're not ready for this. We barely can come to church. It's hard to come on Friday nights and Sabbath and week. We have more time for job and school and work and play to make some money. And very soon you're not going to use that money. Now, if you're going to be saved, why not? Listen, the Bible says, and no man can buy or sell. Save he that hath the mark. How good is a job going to be if you can't use that money? My friends, we will wake up early in the morning so that we can get the job on time. We'll go to school so we can get some degree so that we can get some job to get some more money. 
but we won't spend any time with Jesus. But what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Nothing is more important than knowing Jesus. And we do not have long. And you know what happens right now? The devil's just laughing at our young people. Our young people coming around, their pants hanging down, getting their hair braided, looking back, thinking they're cool. I used to do it. I used to be on this corner thinking it was cool. Looking like a fool. My friends, God is looking for men. God is looking for women. God is looking for families. God is trying to wake us up. Why? The devil is afraid of young people. Why? Because he knows that youth have a power that can move the world. Every major revolution was started by young people. Now listen to me. Listen, listen. Every major revolution was started by young people. Every major change. And the devil says, if I can control the minds of the young people, I can control the world. So he says, let's get them so caught up that they are bored with the Bible. No time for the Bible. We'll watch television for hours. We won't look at the Bible. My friends, this is, the, this is the plan of the devil. Why? Because he's afraid. He does not want us to be saved. Listen to me, young people. Let's take the Bible serious. God is asking us. God is trying to save us. God wants to use our influence. And the Bible says that after the, the, the rise of America to become the world's only superpower, and we know it's there. In fact, this is a Time Magazine front cover. You remember that face, Bill Clinton? There's that cape. Who wears capes? superheroes what's in his hand the world it's identified him as the superpower of the world the bible told us this then it says has america become a what a global bully in other words is it forcing the world is it getting ready to persecute yes it is and we saw that immediately after this we saw this attack that even after this the very constitution has been under more attacks in september 11 than any other time in u.s history People for, for fear were ready to destroy the Constitution. This says, will our liberties be destroyed? Time Magazine says, one nation under God has the separation of church and state done what? Gone too far. The world is questioning, maybe we should have a union of church and state to protect us from disaster, to protect us from terrorists, to protect us from all the fears of what's going on around us. My friend, the Constitution is getting ready to be changed. This says... These two men, they, they met for the first time some years back, and it, this is what the paper says. When Pope Benedict greets U.S. President Barack Obama at Vatican on July 10, the symbolism and the sheer power of the encounter will keep the pundits shattering away. It says here, the 82-year-old man in white, the world's most what? Recognizable religious leader and head of its largest single denomination comes face to face with the charismatic first Black president of the world's what? Last superpower. The world themselves don't even know what they're saying. You know, this is the last nation the Bible says will, will be able to influence the world before Jesus comes. This is it. This is the last. This is the final generation. We're going to prove it today and tomorrow. This is it. We have just a few short years before this whole world comes to an end and we're playing games. I said we're playing games. And God is saying we better take it serious. We better take our homes. Men, you better sit your homes down. And you better say, I've been playing games, honey. I've been playing games, children. Pray with your children. Tell them we messed up. We haven't lived right. We haven't lived right. Tell them. Let's start over. You know, we can start over tonight. I don't care how many mistakes we made. We can start over tonight. And my brothers and my sisters, look at what this says. It says the president of the world's last superpower and then we're told that when they shall say peace and safety, the world is going to come to an end. Now listen to me. This says in Detroit News, July 7, 1998, John Paul II issued a stern warning. That was the previous pope. Notice what he said. Sunday must be what? Sanctified and a violator should be punished as a heretic. That's what it said in the paper. You know how heretics were punished? We studied it. They were, they were, their heads were cut off. They were burned at the stake. They were thrown into rivers inside bags with rattlesnakes while they were being bitten to their death because they would not give up the name of Jesus. Because they would not turn from the Bible. And you think that we can come in church with hats on as men and think we're ready for this? I'm going to ask, please.
Can we respect God and take our hats off if we're men in the church? This is serious. Not, 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 I'm talking about men, not women. I'm talking about men. You see, my friends, we must give God the honor that's due to him. Amen? Amen. You see, we must train our youth and adults that this is serious. This world is coming to an end. And God is saying, please, while there is still time, let us get to know Jesus. Amen. We don't have much time left. Look what this says. This says, violators should be punished. How? As a heretic. Now listen to this. You know what that is? You know what that means when that man kisses the ground? When a pope kisses the ground, do you know what it means, my friends? That means the world has been dedicated to the, to the pope. It means that the world has been betrayed, has been united, that he has conquered, and America has already been kissed. Every country upon this world has been kissed. I went over to Africa doing some meetings, and when I got there, I asked them, did he kiss the ground? They kissed the ground! Every country has been kissed that dedicates the world to the immaculate heart of what he calls Mary so that the world is under the control of the beast. My friends, my son, this is serious. Look at what this says now. I'm going to jump past this. We'll come back to this tomorrow. I'm going to jump past this. We, got some, we have to get some ground to cover. Now listen, everything happens in this order, but now I want you to see something. I want you to see something. Take your Bibles now, and I want you to go over in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. What did I say? Deuteronomy. To the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Notice what this says. In Deuteronomy 18, I want you to see this. In Deuteronomy 18, you're there, amen? amen? Notice what the Bible says beginning now in chapter 18. Speaking of a prophet, do you know the Bible says that God has given his church a prophet? You know that, don't you? In fact, in Deuteronomy 18, the Bible says that he will raise up a prophet. In Deuteronomy 18, while the world has its psychics, God has his prophets. In Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 15, and let me read that together. Let's read it. You're there, amen? Verse 15, the Bible says, The Lord thy God will do what? Raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall you do what? So if you believe the Bible, shall we believe in prophets? Now we know there are many false prophets. So how can we distinguish between a true prophet and a false prophet? Now there are many tests. Time will not allow us to go through all the tests of a prophet. But right here today, in this chapter, it gives us one test. In verses 19, notice what it says. In verse 18. Verse 18 says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren and like unto thee, and I will put my words where? In his mouth. So the words of a prophet is not the words of that prophet. It is the word of God. The Bible says, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that it was whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Verse 20 says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall what? You know, the question is, the prophet says, then, that the person says, Well, how can I know the truth from the false? Verse 20 says, 21 says, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? The answer is given in verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing does what? Follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath what? Not spoken. But the prophet has spoken presumptuously, thou shall not be what? Afraid of him, the Bible says that a true prophet, when they tell us what's going to take place, is going to do what? It's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, that's not a true prophet. That's a false prophet. Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, do you know the Bible tells us that that remnant church is going to have the spirit of prophecy? Now, many of you don't know, but this Seventh Avenue church, that remnant has been given a prophet by the name of Ellen G. White. Now, my friends, that prophet over 100 years ago, she met every test of the ancient biblical prophets, and today this church is afraid to talk about her. But nowhere in the Bible were the nation of Israel afraid of her prophets. Now, my friends, listen to me. I want to show you because the way to test the prophet is to listen to their words and see if they're in harmony with the Bible. The way to test the prophet is to see if what they said has come to pass. Does it make sense? Is that what the Bible says? And if we believe in that, we're not believing in someone else. We're believing in the Bible. And when the Bible says that a prophet's going to come, we're believing in the Bible to believe the prophet. Now, my friends, look at what the prophet says. Now, I want you to notice when she wrote it. What year is this? 
I want to read some of the writing just for a moment. This is 1886. Now notice what the prophet says. Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to what? The Roman power. Now, in 1886, they would have thought that woman was a fanatic. You know why? Do you remember what I showed you from the Time magazine? That in 1899, I said 18 what? The Pope said America was a heresy. Here is 1886, years before that was said. And this prophesied that Protestantism would again join with what? No historian would have said that. You know, one of the biggest charges against Ellen White, if you look her up, one of the biggest charges is that she's a plagiarist. Now, my friends, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to show you some things she talked about in the course of two days where, where the newspapers had not even written them before she said it. If anybody plagiarized, it would have to be the newspapers. My friends, listen to this. 1886, now watch what it says. It says, Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power, then there will be a what? A law against the Sabbath of God's creation, and then it is that God will do his what? So that tells us, if we look at the order of events, that first Protestantism shall join with the Roman Catholic Church, and then we will see a Sunday law. Are you with me? It says, Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power, what? Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. And so first, Rome and Protestants would join together, and then a son in law Are you following me? Now, the world would never believe that. Now, go back to Revelation 13. I'm going to show you the Bible says the same thing that the prophet says. You think they say something different? No, a prophet must also always agree with the Bible. I want you to follow this now. I want you to follow this. So we're noticing, we're noticing now this, this union between Rome. We're noticing now this, 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 this union between Rome and America. Now look at Revelation 13. Let's see that from the Bible. Revelation 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Where in the Bible? Let me test you because we studied enough. Let me test you. Make sure you don't forget that we're teaching. Amen. Let me test you. Open book. Where in the Bible does it say that, that America and Rome were join together? Now we read that in the prophet. But is that in the Bible? Where in the Bible? We've already studied it. Where in the Bible? Revelation 13, what two verses? 11 and 12, it said that the second beast would join with what? First beast, second beast, America, first beast, Rome, that they would work together. So the same thing the prophet says, the Bible says. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and my sisters, the question is, has this happened? Because what we said was that there were six things since 1990 until the passing of a Sunday law. Now, we don't have time tonight and tomorrow to deal with all six of those things. And so I want to deal with only the ones that have a present bearing on where we are today. And I have to bring in three and four. We'll skip one and two. We have DVDs, CDs that you can study and find out all the rest. But, but three and four. And I'm going to put both of those up on the board so that we can study it as we're looking at it now. Number three, Protestants. And Catholics must do what? Must unite. That's what the Bible says. That's what the prophet says. Let's see. Do you think that's happened? Now, if you think it's happened, we need to make sure it's in history. Everything we believe should be traced where? On the page of history. Let's watch and see if it happened. And this came from a newspaper. This was the Huntsville Times in, in 1995. It says, Christian Coalition wants what? Now, I want you to look what they said. Now, what year is this? 1995. Now, watch now. We're moving now. We're past 1990. We're moving in an order. Now, watch what happens. It says, would you read this with me, those who can read it? It says, the idea that there can be some kind of alliance between the Christian coalition, that's Protestants, and the Roman Catholic Church is what? Nonsense. I want you to hold up now. Hold on. What year is this? Now, we said that by 1990, America became the only superpower, Sunday law must be passed. One and two happened, but then we said that, that it must happen in its order, and we found out that by 1995, they said the idea that this could happen, number three, was what? So in 1995, were Rome and America together? So I want to ask a question. We're in 2010. Are they together now? Well, if it's so, we must see the history. Is that right? 
Let's watch. 1995, nine cents. Now, I was in California and doing some meetings like this. Pick some of this up. This is in 1999. This is the Sacramento Bee 1999. Let's blow that up. Now, listen to what it says. Catholics, Lutherans, finally reach an agreement on salvation. 1995, nonsense. The Bible says it's going to happen. The prophet said it's going to happen. I believe we got a true prophet. Now watch. Now I want you to watch what this says. It says, and it's amazing that that's the Lutherans. Why is it important that the Lutherans, they were the first to leave the Protestants and start the Protestant Reformation. But for the Lutherans to go back to Rome, to return to her mother, means that the Protestant Reformation has come to an end. Luther would have turned in his grave if he could uh, come back to life. But my friends, the dead know they're dead. Amen. Amen. It says the great 482 year dispute between Catholics and Protestants is about to end. Now think about this. It didn't say the great 482 year dispute between Catholics and Lutherans. It said Catholics and what? Protestants. Now this is 1999. Somebody who knows math, you tell me, you take me back 482 years. 1999, you put in your papers, you subtract 482 years. Would you help your father out? Help him out. Help him out. <laughs> help your father. That's all right. We can help our father. Children are going to help fathers. Amen? This is too important to let, us, to let us wake up on. Let's wake up. Now watch, watch. Now watch. Now what is it? Now that gave us enough time to calculate. Is that right? What is it? 1517. What date is that? What date is that? What happened in 1517? Now, come on now. You had to understand history. Come on. 482 years. What happened in 1517? In 1570, that was the year that Martin Luther went to the church in Wittenberg in Germany and nailed the 95 Thesis on that church and started the Protestant Reformation. They signed it on the very day that Luther nailed it to the, uh, to the, to the door of Wittenberg. As a symbol that it was coming to an end. Now remember now we read that when Protestants and Catholics come together that then we're going to see a Sunday law after that. Are you with me? Now let me read again. I want you to put that into it. Now watch. It says the great 482 year dispute between Catholics and Protestants not is ending but is about to end. So in other words in 1999 the Sunday law was a about to be passed. Because before the Sunday law, Protestants and Catholics must first what? Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. Now my brothers and my sisters, so in 1999, we should have knew in 1999 that Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. And do you know that in 1999 many Christians got serious? Not because of the Bible though, but because of Y2K. You remember why? Don't act like you didn't forget Y2K. I'm about to say, you had some water stocked up. <laughs> my brothers and my sisters, and many of us, while we were watching Y2K, I was preaching about this. The, 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 the smoke screen took place, and the greatest prophetic fulfillment took place in that same year. I can't talk about it tonight. We don't have enough time. But my friends, when that took place, something happened and, and our eyes were averted we should have known and there were people that were serious but then when nothing happened on y2k you you went to sleep you didn't party that uh, that new year's you were too afraid but the next day when nothing happened you went back to life as usual there were people that left the cities and went to the country and now living back in the cities you're going to find out something about these cities in just a little while because when number five comes, my friends, and it's over, when number six happens, the cities you don't want to live in and then. My friends, we were told that we should get out of the cities and to retire places in the country. Yes. No, please, don't help me. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> now, this says that it's about to end. Now, my question is, is did it end? 1999, it's about to end. We see a movement moving in its order. 1990, superpower. One and two took place. Now, if you understood what one and two was, you will see why Protestants and Catholics are getting closer. But now, three comes. Now, let's look now. Let's see what happened in history. 
Now listen to what it says. Last day events. Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. And then it is that God will do his strange work in the earth. Let's see what happened. Now listen. Catholic bishops what? Join the what? Christian alliance. 1999 it said it was about to happen. You know what year this is? 2004. Are we moving in order? Yes. Watch. Listen to what it says. November 17, 2004. The nation's Roman Catholic bishops voted Wednesday to join a new alliance that would be the broadest Christian group ever formed in the United States of America. Linking. Now listen. It says join what? What's another word for linking? Joining. Joining. That's what the prophet said. That's what the Bible says. Joining, linking American evangelicals, that's Protestants, and Catholics in an ecumenical organization for what? For the first. Has this ever happened before? There's some people who say, oh, we've always seen wars and rumors of wars. We've always seen this, but this has never happened. Never seen America become the superpower. This has never happened since the uh, origin of America in 1776. But my friends, by 2004, it says America joined, uh, that Rome joined the Christian church for the first time. Listen to what it says. Lincoln American Evangelicals and the Catholics and the ecumenical organization for the first time. The alliance called what? Christian churches together in the USA. You want to write that down. You better remember that. Christian churches together. You want to remember that. CCT. So it happened now, 2004, but remember now, in 2005, it said that the idea that there could be a, a, some kind of alliance between the Christian coalition and the Roman Catholic Church is what? Nonsense. So in 1995, this number three was called nonsense by the world, prophecy by the Bible, and the spirit of prophecy. But my brothers and sisters, what was called nonsense in 1995 became perfect sense in 2005. In 2005, it was set to go into effect in 2005. That was November 17. It went into effect the next year. So, in 10 years, from 1995 to 2005, we saw a total change. But that's only number three. My friends, we found out that number four must take place. What is number four? Number four is, and number four, it is pro the leading Protestant Churches in America must all unite. What did I say? The leading Protestant churches in America must all unite. Watch this now. Now this is another word of the prophet now. This was written in 1888. Watch the prophet again. And let's see if the Bible says the same thing. Watch what the prophet says. It says, when the what? Leading churches. Not every church, but the what? Leading churches. When the leading churches, not all around the world, but the leading churches of what? The United States. Uniting upon what? Such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall do what? Shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy or an image of the beast. And the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. In other words, when the image of the beast is formed, inevitably persecution takes place. Dragon takes place. Now, my friends, listen to me. This says then, before persecution, before the Sunday law, there must be this uniting of the churches, this image of the beast that makes a Sunday law. Now, I want to ask you a question. What are the two things that are developed in the image of the beast? Here, right here, in this open book test. Amen. I'm going to give you a lot of open book tests. The answer is right up there. There are two things specifically that makes the image of the beast. And it's right here. I want to test you. Make sure you're studying. Amen. Make sure you're awake. Two things. What are the two things? What are the two things? And you sound like Babylon. Not the remnant. Come on now. All right, number one. Number one, the leading 
Churches must what? Unite. All right, must unite. Then what's the second thing? Shall influence the, what will we call that? What, 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 do we ha what happens when the government influence the state? What do we call that? A union. So when a church, the leading churches, and that makes sense, they all have to come together in order to influence the state. Is that right? If they are apart, they can't influence the state being divided. So they must unite, and once they unite, then they shall influence the state. The church will influence the state, and when the church influences the state, we have a what? Union of what? Church and state. Something must happen in the Constitution, is that right? Because it, it, it prevents this. Now, so an image of the beast consists of these two things. Now, this is what the prophet said. I wonder if that's in the Bible. And Revelation 13 is right here. Look at what it says It's Revelation 13. It says in verse 14, and deceiveth them. Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which it had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, them that dwell on the earth that they should do what? Make an image to what? So the image of the beast is going to look just like what? The beast. Now I want to ask you a question. If you were to go to the mirror and you look into a mirror, when you look into the mirror, what do you see? Whatever is looking into the mirror. Are you, after, are you with me? You see an image. So when America forms an image of the beast, it means that America's government is going to do something that makes it look like the beast or the Roman church. So the structure of his government, now watch the structure of the American government. Are you with me? Now watch the beast. The beast was the world power, is that right? The beast was the civil and religious power, is that right? So that means in the beast was there a union of church and state. So in the image of the beast, there must be a union of what? Church and state. Now watch me, watch this now. What is the beast's name? What is the church's name? The Roman Catholic Church system. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does the word Catholic mean? It's the Latin word for universal. What does universal mean? No, what does it mean? It, 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 it symbolizes the whole world, but universal means what? What's the, when we say bicycle, bi means two. Is that right? What does uni mean? One. So when it says it is the universal... The Roman Catholic Church was the, was the one religion, the one church. And when you have the one church, you call it the world church. Now watch. Now, if America is going to form an image of the beast, and America's Protestants has over 101 different denominations, in order for the 101 different denominations or more to form an image of the beast, it must form a Catholic church. Protestant America, or a what? Universal. It must form a uni church. How can many different churches form a uni church? By uniting. So in order to form an image of the beast, there must be an ecumenical movement of all of the different Protestant churches uniting and coming together so that they form a uni church. Have you seen an ecumenical movement today? where all of the different churches have been coming together, Christian churches together, for the purpose of getting to one church. And my friends, this is what the Bible says. But not only does it have a uni church with the uniting of all the church, but then it says that the first beast had, was civil and religious at the same time. It was both a civil power and religious power, and we showed you that there's no other church that has an ambassador. Only nations have ambassadors means it's a civil power, and at the same time, it's a church. So it's a union of church and state. So in order for America to form an image of the beast, not only must the leading churches unite, but they must influence the state so that there is a union of church and state. You see, when the Sunday law is passed, you couldn't have a Sunday law without a union of church and state. A law comes from what? Church or state? A government. Laws, governments pass laws, states pass laws. But when you talk about Sunday worship, that doesn't come from a law, that, uh, from a, a, a government. That comes from a church. 
So to have a Sunday law means that you must unite a church and a state. And in the very act of passing a Sunday law, there is formed an image of the beast. My brothers and my sisters, listen to me. My question is, because number four is, the leading Protestant churches have to unite. Is that right? My question is, have they united? If we believe it should be traced where? On the page of history. We'll skip past all that. Now watch. Now watch what it says. Protestants do what? Move toward affiliation despite differences. This is 2003. Watch what this says. Leaders propose what? Christian alliance. Let's blow that up. This is 2003. Let's look what it says. Church leaders from 30 denominations agreed Wednesday on a proposal to create the broadest alliance of Christians ever formed in the United States. This is the first time. What year? 2003. Now remember now, the Protestant and Catholics came together what year? 2004. Watch now. You know what they joined? Christian churches together. This is the same group that started in 2003. Now watch. Look what they're coming together for. Look what it says. It says, the proposal being sent, uh, being sent churches says that, that, that the alliance will exist mostly for what? What the prophet said? By uniting of such points of faith that are held by them in common. This says, Later it will begin more active and live and speaking to society. Does the Bible say they're going to speak? Like a dragon. And it says, it says speaking and sponsoring this forum. And it says they're coming together and says, which is, it says the Catholic Church and most evangelicals and Protestant Pentecostals do not belong to the National Council of Churches, which is currently the nation's largest ecumenical group. In 2003, the Catholic Church wasn't a part of it. Then it says, but if the new alliance does emerge, it can supplant the national councils and radically alter its role in the American Christianity. And it did. And by 2004, but the strangest thing is this. This says, when the leading churches of the United States, united upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy or the image of the beast. We saw that in 2004, the Roman Catholic Church joined the same group, but did you know there was one church that did not join it? Now listen to me now. It says the image of the beast is what? In 2003, almost every major church had joined, except for uh, the Catholic Church first, and then the Southern Baptists. But notice what it says here now. This is 2004. Let's see that. This is the end of that paper, 2004. It says... The Catholic Church has an ongoing ecumenical dialogue with many denominations. However, some evangelical and Pentecostal churches have resisted participating. In the floor debate Wednesday, New York Cardinal Edward Egan noted that those churches were worried that such talks risk and watering down their faith. So whenever you have an ecumenical movement, when it's not on the Bible, it watered down the faith. You know, that's what has happened to the remnant church. That's what has happened to the logo of this church. Now this says, in fact, read it with me, the Evangelical Southern Baptist Convention, which has more than 16 million members and is the largest Protestant denomination in the country, has so far not agreed to fully join the Christian churches together. You know, when I read this, I was doing meetings like this, and I knew that after 1995 and 1999 and 2003, I knew that it was almost time for the Sunday law. And I said, Lord, what's wrong? Almost every other church is together. I know it must happen. I said, what in the world? Because, you know, if the Southern Baptist Church is the largest church, you know what it is? The leading church. But the prophet says, not every church, but the leading church is what unite. And the largest leading church in 2004 did not unite. And I said, Lord, what does it mean? And I began to start studying. And all of a sudden, I was doing a meeting like this, and I got this, and I was doing a meeting. And then when I finished the meeting, 
I went in, uh, I had to, to go home and I was driving home and I went past a gas station. I stopped at a gas station and all of a sudden the Lord said, you need to get that newspaper. I said, what? I looked at the newspaper and you know what I saw on the front cover of the newspaper? Not this. Now this is 2004. Something was happening in 2004. Why isn't Sunday special anymore? But in 2004, I got this paper. It says, Justice Sunday. Who holds the power? The people hold the power. You know who's going to influence the state? The people. You know who's going to pass the Sunday law? The people. This says Justice Sunday. How many heard of Justice Sunday? Very few hands. Do you know how serious this is? This is prophetic. Almost every major minister in the country is a part of this. Calling for churches to come back. And when I saw it, it was unbelievable. I blew it up and it says here, here's James Dobson. And my friends, if you really understand who James Dobson is, as a serious fellow. My friends, this says, we are not just going to sit back and let America to go down the ramp of immorality alone. It says that they have problems in evangelical church and the Catholic church must deal with the more issues. They said all of our churches need to come together. America is in trouble. Is America in trouble? They said the morality is messed up. Is the morality messed up? They said the problems in our, our social world is in trouble. And so the Christians said we must come together to save America. Nothing wrong with that. But in the process of coming together, my friends, there's an ecumenical movement. But, but, but as I said, all of this, if you understand prophecy, is being fulfilled in Revelation 13. But when I got to the end, I was driving in the car. I couldn't read. And so I said to my wife, I said, would you read it for me? She was my GPS. I said, she was my GPS. <laughs> I, said, I let her read to me. I said, oh, honey, would you read it? I can feel something happening in prophecy. And she read it and everything I said, oh, it's prophecy. But when she read the last paragraph, it was almost like my hair just stood up. I said, honey, would you read that again? No, she read. This is what she read. This is what I heard. I listened. It's a new day. A new day. Liberalism is dead. The majority of Americans are conservative. You can count on us. Here's a group that you couldn't count on before. But it said you can count on us for showing up and speaking out and let the church rise. And that wouldn't make much difference to me until I heard who said it. Sutton, first vice president, of the Nashville-based Southern Baptist Convention, the nation's largest Protestant body, closed with five sentences. It's a new day. Last year I wasn't with you, but it's a new day. Liberalism is dead. He said now he joined the Christian churches together. He joined that, the, the churches ecumenical and coming together. And my friends, as of 2005, every leading Protestant church is already united. That's number four. And do you know that number five brought us to 2008? Number five is going to bring the conditions that cause a Sunday law to be passed. And number six, my friends, I wonder what would happen because once the churches come together, what's the next step? They must influence the state to pass a Sunday law. I wonder what's going to get the attention of the people. Everybody's not going to church on Sunday. Everybody's not going to church on Saturday. Most people are not going to church on any day. What is going to make them want a Sunday law? Somebody says 9-11. No, it's not going to be 9-11. Something worse than that. Something that's going to bring a change to America. Something that's going to bring the Sunday law. Something that's going to make us say, oh, those Sunday law is not so crazy. Something that's going to make the majority of people demand a Sunday law. You know what it's going to be? The love of money. The Bible says, 
for the love of money is the root of how much? All evil. Is the mark of the beast evil? You can't get worse than evil. So if the mark of the beast is evil, what is at the foundation of the mark of the beast? The, not money, the love of money. For the love of money, man is going to pass a Sunday law. My brothers and sisters, this is why the Bible says that no man can buy or sell. Save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Look at it in Revelation 13 as we get ready to close. In verse 16, the Bible says, concerning the beast, it says, And cause of all, both what? Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17 says, And that no man might what? Buy or sell. Save he that have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. My friends, for the love of money, this Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. Man is going to believe it. My friends, there's going to be a complete financial collapse in the United States of America. Right now today, tell me something. Can everybody buy and sell today? Yes, everybody can buy and sell today. Doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Baptist. Doesn't matter if you're an atheist. Doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a Mason. Right now, today, you can buy or sell, but the Bible says there's coming a time when no man can buy or sell save he have the mark of the beast. That economy is not in place today. That tells us that before the Sunday law is passed, something must happen to the global economy. You think that that $100 mistake that just was made where billions were lost when the $100 couldn't be printed, you think that was accidental? You think that our government, our country is going to get better. My friends, I'm going to show you tomorrow that this financial crisis is going to get so bad that man will wish that he knew Jesus. I'm going to show you tomorrow that this is the very thing as we studied that is going to prove that we're in the final generation. Let me tell you something. How many heard of the baby boomers? If you are a baby boomer, that generation will not pass until all these things are fulfilled. This is the generation. This is it. And it's amazing that while everything is ready, just one more thing, that's number four. Number five is the beginning. We're going to find out that in 2011, we're going to get to the end. We're going to come to the, very, uh, the, the second and final phase of number five that is going to bring on number six. When that happens, the Sunday law is here. No question, everything is going to happen just as it is in its order. Everything is ready but you and me. We're playing. We're running here and there. We're, 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 we're not spending our time getting to know Jesus. And God is saying, wake up. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. I was reading the other day of what was going on even in space. Do you know that right now they're saying that the most watched constellation in the sky is the Orion? You don't even have to be religious. Go to the encyclopedia. They say of all the constellations, the Orion is the most watched constellation. They're saying today, I have a newspaper where, where they're saying that scientists are saying that there are strange sounds that are coming out of the Orion. They call it squawkings. The scientists are saying that there's strange light coming out of the Orion right now today. And they don't know what it is. NASA has actually sent a probe in and has been watching and just watching the light come out and out and they don't know what it is. One sign that said, what could it be? But I don't wonder what it is. The prophet says that Jesus is going to come back through that Orion. The prophet says that that is the gateway through heaven and that the Orion, the Bible says, can, can, who can loosen the band of Orion? And Job. The band is being loosened. It's opening. For the return of Jesus Christ. Even the heavens are declaring that Jesus is coming. This is it. Everything is ready except for you and me. My friends, what should the prophet again the whole world to lose our souls? Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, and I want to make an appeal tonight. There's somebody here that says, Lord, I've been playing games with God. Father, as we get ready to close, please. 
speak to our hearts, Lord. Time is almost finished. We have just a few short months, Lord. You told us that from 1990 there was only six more events before the Sunday law. Five of them have already taken place. One more, Lord, and we're not ready. Please, Lord, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Your eyes are closed. And there's someone that knows that their heart is not right with Jesus. We're not talking, we're just listening, we're praying. There's someone that says, Lord, my heart is not right with Jesus. I don't know you like I should. But I want to. I want to rededicate my heart to you. I want to give my heart to you so that when everything breaks loose, that my heart can be safe in Jesus. And I want to give you an opportunity to come to Jesus. The only reason why we've been lost, I don't care how bad we've been, is if we don't come to Jesus. And tonight, I want to give us an opportunity to come. If there's someone, you may be old or you may be young, and you say, Lord, I want to come to Jesus. I want you to stand up right where you are. And by standing, you're saying, Lord, I give my heart to Jesus. By standing, you're saying, Lord, I want to be ready to meet Jesus. Praise God. But I don't want to just give a general appeal. I believe that there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I need to be born again. I don't need to just rededicate my life. I've been going in the wrong direction. But tonight, I see it clearly. I see that time is almost finished. I see that you've showed this to me because you love me. And I see that you want to save me. And tonight, you say, Lord, I want to go all the way with Jesus. I want to be born again. I know there's someone like here today. I know there's someone young. I know there's someone old. And you need to make a decision tonight. You don't have past tonight. Tonight is the time to make that decision. And if there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I want to make that decision tonight. I want to ask that you just slip out of your seat and come down the aisle. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, I know there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, it's serious. Praise God. I want to be born again. I don't just want to make a general appeal. I want my life to be different. And that means today I need to be born again. You know by the things that you have in your heart, the thoughts you think, there is somebody right now that has been playing with pornography. No man playing with pornography is ready to meet Jesus. There was one pastor that came out on the Time magazine that while he should have been studying, he was looking at pornography. Video games. He was looking on his computer, sneaking around, watching there are men tonight that are struggling with pornography that God is saying, you can't be ready to meet Jesus. You can't be a man watching pornography. Nobody knows about it but you and God. Your wife doesn't even know about it. I said your wife doesn't know about it. No, listen to me. Listen. But you want God to break it. Not just pornography, but there's sins of anger and abuse. You know that there are many things. It's not just pornography. There are many sins that we're holding on to. It's the sins of pride. Sin of self-righteousness. Tonight, you're saying, Lord, I don't want to play with God. Oh, my friends, tonight, don't care about the crowd. Do you know that Jesus was on a cross naked, unashamed to save you, and you're going to be ashamed to come to Jesus? Jesus said, if you're ashamed to come to me, then I'm going to be ashamed to testify for you in heaven. My friend, don't be ashamed to come to Christ. If there's someone here tonight, you may be a man, you may be a woman, maybe you haven't been faithful. Maybe you haven't been studying and praying like you should. Maybe the CD collection that you have is a testimony that the devil has your heart. But tonight, I don't care how terrible we've been if we but come to Jesus. Your eyes are closed. Your heads are bowed. You're praying. Because if you're looking around, maybe you need to come down here. It was the man that said, Lord, the man Judas, when Jesus was in the upper room, everybody said, Lord, is it I? And Judas didn't say it at first. But he was the very one that betrayed his Lord. You're praying and saying, Lord, is it me? And the way you know it's you is because you know the Spirit is telling you to move. But in your mind, you're saying, Lord, it can't be me. You're closing your eyes. You're praying. You're saying, is it I, Lord? Praise God. Praise God. Is there some other man, some other woman that wants to be men, that want to be women, that say, Lord, I'm, a, I'm ashamed. But I want to start over again. Is there somebody else that says, Lord, I'm going all the way? Forget everybody else in this congregation. Just think of you and Jesus. Your eyes are closed. Is it you? Is it you? 
My friends, the probation would have closed tonight. Would you have been saved? Is there someone that says, Lord, I want to be born again? Let me tell you something. Young people, listen to me. Unless you make a decision now, it's going to be too late. No better time than now do you want to give your heart to Jesus. Praise God. Well, I'm getting ready to close this prayer. Let me tell you something. Do you know there are many people that are listening to songs from Jay-Z? You think that a man listening to Jay-Z or Beyonce are going to be saved? Do you know that if Beyonce or Jay-Z were Christians, they would throw their own music away? And many of them, you know that some of these people are going to hear this message and are going to throw down their music. Some of them are going to be saved and come to Jesus while you listen to their music and be lost. My friends, we can't break any of this without Jesus. But if you know that you're not right with Christ, the only answer is to come. Said, come. The Spirit and the Bride said, come. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsted, come. And I don't care how sinful we've been, Jesus went to the cross so that we can be saved. He's able to say to the uttermost those that come, is there one more that says, Lord, I need to be born again. I need to be baptized. I need to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I'm closing now. My friend, saddest of all words that ever fell upon human ear are those words of doom, I know you not. And can you imagine, have been called a Seventh-day Adventist or a Christian? Can you imagine coming to weeks of prayer and prayer meetings, being pastors or elders or members of the church, but not knowing Jesus? Can you imagine being an usher in this meeting, recording this meeting, playing for this meeting, preaching in this meeting and being lost? If you know that you're not right with Jesus, if you know that you don't know him, my friend, the only thing to do is to come. Is there one more as I close tonight? Just one more that says, Lord, I want to come. Let us pray. Oh, Father, you have spoken to us tonight. The end of all things that is at hand. And we're not ready, Lord. We can be congregated in the aisles outside and other parts of this church typing and doing other things, but not listening. We can be ushering and, and, and working here, and Lord, we can be like Martha and miss the blessing of Mary. Father, don't let me preach and miss this blessing, Lord. For what would it be to preach to others and to be a castaway? What would it be, Lord, to plan this meeting and count how many people came to the meeting and still be lost? Because we're not thinking of our own souls. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Lord, you see these kneeling souls that have given everything for you. They want to be saved. And Lord, without you, we can do nothing. These ones that have come, Lord, your children, no matter how sinful they have been or we have been, you said, Lord, if we look at Jesus, that you can cleanse us from all sin. That you can help us to start over. That you can save our marriages, our homes. That you can cause these youth to be an army to finish the work. Lord, bless those that have come forward. There are others, Lord, that have been talking and they've been playing that they need to come. Speak to their hearts tonight, Lord. Agitate their souls that they may see the love of Jesus. And may see a desire forming a relationship with him before it is too late. Seal the commitments that have been made tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the revival and reformation that has begun tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Save us and use us to save many others. By pointing them to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of this world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that you do something special for me tonight. Those that have come forward, if you will stay. 
And those of you who have not come forward, we are thankful that you have come and have been with us tonight. And we want to dismiss this place very solemnly. God's presence is in this room. Some of you might want to stay back just a little longer and pray. Not talk, but pray. Others may want to get home and pray. I want to ask that if you have not come forward, that when we say and, and, and get ready to dismiss, that you will just gently, quietly stand up and leave out of the church and allow those who have come forward to sit down in these front two aisles so that we can at least just get their names. And then we'll pray and let even you go and leave. We have an early morning tomorrow. We have a special day. It's going to be our last meeting. Amen. We want everyone to be here on time. We're going to have our meeting tomorrow, one at 11, another at 4. And I'm going to pray that every one of us will be here with family and friends. And we're going to see that, that we only have a few months left. What do we need to be doing, my friends, so that we can be ready to meet Jesus? And so I'm going to ask at this time, you may consider yourself dismissed. If you have not come forward, may God's blessings be upon you this Sabbath. I'm going to ask if you will reverently just consider yourself dismissed. And we'll see you tomorrow. Sabbath school starts at 9.30. The meetings will start at 11. Let's be here early. Let's pray for each other. Amen? Amen. And those who have come forward, please, if you will stay, those who will come forward in these front two aisles. And if our elders can come quickly with the cards so we can give to each one. And if you will pass out quickly, our elders.